Commercial Drones FM is brought to you by FLIR Delta. Delta is the definitive source for thermal drone knowledge, best practices, and training. Go to FLIR.com slash Delta and get started now. Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey everybody, welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Ian here, and I'm sitting in Drone Deploy headquarters in San Francisco, California, with our guest today, Jono Millen. Welcome to the show, Jono. Thanks, Ian. Great to be here. Well, it's good to have you because this is actually the second time that we've attempted to do a podcast. Do you remember the first time? I do. And for everyone who missed it, you missed out. It was a great event. It was a good event. It was kind of, it was somewhat, I was a little bit disappointed. So I had this um, event at uh, a specific venue here in San Francisco. Must have been a year ago, but you were there. Uh, Romeo Dersher from DJI was there. Uh, Jesse Mooberry from Airbus was there. And we had this event and I was supposed to record the full panel and everything. And then the audio guy fell through and then we were never able to air it as a podcast. But we're here now. We'll so make we can make the it. most. Yeah, we'll make the most of it. Um, and so, again, thank you. Uh, just full disclosure. So, Drone Deploy is my alma mater. I am a shareholder in the company, a proud shareholder. Uh, worked for Drone Deploy for about three and a half years. So, it was a very, very fun time. But with that said, it'll kind of give me some great insight, I think, to ask some really good questions of Jono. And Jono is a very, very smart guy. Um, worked with him for many years, as I mentioned. So, again, thank you for being here, Jono. You are the chief customer officer and co founder at Drone Deploy. So for people who are new to drones or maybe haven't heard of Drone Deploy, tell us a little bit about the company. Like what is Drone Deploy? Yeah, no, great question. So the way I kind of think of it, you know, we're sitting in San Francisco, I'm looking outside and out in the hills, I see just all these buildings and all these, these things and these highways and bridges. And really when it comes down to it, the, the real world is hard to just measure and track and a bunch of stuff is changing. So how do we help uh, people in construction, people in agriculture, people in mining? How do we help them understand what the world looks like today, what the world looked like a couple of weeks ago, compare it and track the changes that are going on there, and do that in a way that's really accessible and really easy to understand? And so what Drone Deploy is doing is making it uh, possible to automatically fly drones, capture a whole bunch of images, and turn those into 2D maps and 3D models, and then create a bunch of analysis tools to measure and track change um, in those 3D models so that you can actually start to understand things like how, how much uh, volume is there in the stockpile? How many trucks do I need to take it out? What changed since last week? Are we building our construction project uh, according to the plans that we laid out? And being able to identify any of those issues and where things are going wrong faster just saves so many cycles and so much money, uh, time, energy as a result. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's so true. Just having talked to so many drone deploy customers and users over the years, um, it was really like awesome in the in the early days. Drone deploy was founded. What in, year? Founded in 2013. 2013. I should know that. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. I know it. Um, but in the early days, yeah, like I think we, a lot of people say it was still like science project -y days, like back in 2013, where like there's this new technology and it was just really trying to find the businesses um, that could make use of it. And so Drone Deploy has um, kind of found that and focused on a few industries. To, can you just tell us a little bit more about the industries that, that Drone Deploy is like helping to use this drone data and like take actionable you know, actions yeah. <laughs> on their sites. Yeah. From flights to insights, as they say. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically everything out there in the world that changes is, is where we help our customers, but there are things that change that are worth a bunch of money that people care about a lot. Uh, the biggest one is probably in construction, you know, in, in the U S it's something in the order of 80%, sorry, the average construction project is 80% over budget. So almost twice as expensive as it should be. And the average construction project is also 20 months overdue. And so when you start to think of like the trillion dollar industry that is construction and start to think about 80% inefficiencies and 20 months overdue, there's like a ton of money that could be saved and there's a ton of energy that could be better used if we could just figure out where we were going wrong sooner. Wow. So that's, that's the biggest driver for us. 
you know, the second one for us is in agriculture. Um, there are 450 million acres of farmable land in the US, somewhere around there. And for somebody to understand where problems are in their fields and to try and make a change and then to see whether that change is being helpful or not. You know, uh, in the days of old, it was literally walking around in eight foot tall corn in random patterns and, and hopefully you bump into an issue. And now with the touch of a button, you can fly a drone, make a map in real time and see exactly where those issues are and walk right over to them instead of, instead of stumbling in the dark pretty much. Totally. And I think that was, uh, that was one of my, like the kind of similar to a light bulb moment where I would be talking to a lot of these growers and farmers and yeah, the exactly like what you said, it's like, yeah, the corn's eight, nine, 10 feet tall. Uh, how can you see inside of, uh, how can you see anything? You can't, you try to like stand on the top of the truck, like the, literally the cab of the truck to see something, but it's just so inefficient. So, yeah. um, yeah. Big and stuff then, in agriculture. Yeah, the, the next big one is in energy. And, you know, both in the, the old school energy of oil and gas, uh, but also in the, you know, the, the new wave of renewables. Um, so both in, in wind as well as solar. That's right. So solar would take more of, um, I guess, well, you can use visible imagery on that. I want to get into photogrammetry in just a second. But for solar, um, are we talking just strictly thermal imagery or what, what are we looking at here for, for a customer there? So all of the above, I mean, when you think of a solar project, it is in a sense a construction project. So we do a bunch of work in the pre-construction site survey phase. We do a bunch of work in the actual construction phase as well, as then right at the tail end is the operations and maintenance component. And what I also like to see is, you know, you, you have multiple spectrums you can capture this data in. So we do thermal mapping. We also do the visual spectrum and thermal mapping will tell you that there is a problem. Uh, but the visual spectrum generally helps you figure out what that problem might be. Mm. So you look at a massive map of a, a big, you know, utility scale solar field and you see a hotspot, you can zoom into that hotspot and then toggle back over to the visual and that'll help you figure out what, what the issue is. You know, is it just a dirty panel or is there actually like a diode that's up? So let's take, let's take not just a step back. Let's take like quite a few steps back and there's this there's this thing um, called photogrammetry, and this is the kind of mechanism in which drone deploy and you know other kind of drone mapping um, companies and software is able to transform these like two D images into these really insightful kind of pieces of data. Um, so can you tell us like just give us a little bit of a primer on like photogrammetry? I mean, this is what's happening in the background when you get those images and then you process them with quote unquote photogrammetry. It's like this black box. Um, <laughs> maybe you could just yeah give us a little bit of uh, a primer on like how photogrammetry works. And this is one of the things that I just find so incredible. And working with photogrammetry for like over five years myself is um, just I still don't know all of the <laughs> things that are happening here. Yeah. Well, let's open the box. So, you know, photogrammetry, what we're really trying to do is create measurements with just light. And so we're, we're taking these photographs and the way I kind of like to think about it is, you know, I've got two eyes, <clears throat> I've got two eyes. And with those two eyes, I can start to see some perspective. I can start to see distance. And so that helps me understand, you know, is something far away or is something close? What we're doing with photogrammetry is when the drone flies around, it's going to take a whole bunch of images over an area of land. And that drone also has a GPS on it. So we know where those photographs were taken. And in the same way that my two eyes with a known distance apart can help me figure out how far away stuff is, each of those photographs kind of acts as like another eye in the sky. And so when we find the same object in a whole bunch of overlapping images, we can do a whole bunch of math and computer vision work in order to calculate what the distance is between the camera and that point. So we do that to every single pixel on the map, and that will end up with, with every pixel having not just a, a, an X and a Y location, but also having a depth, a Z location. And so when you upload your images to Drone Deploy, what our computers are doing is they're trying to take this image, they're breaking it down to find recognizable key points that might be visible in other images. So a completely blank white wall, there's not much to kind of say, oh yeah, this is the same place in two adjacent images, but something like a corner or a manhole or something that's relatively distinct. If you find that in one image, you can probably find that in the image next door. 
And so the first step is finding all of those different key points. And then we try and figure out how those key points might match together. And using that, uh, we have like an initial set of assumptions on where we think the camera is. And we, we update the camera locations based on those key point matches. And it's this process of, of kind of refining um, camera locations and positions and uh, distances and, and locations of things in images that will slowly recreate this uh, three-dimensional image. And so once all of those different key points have a space in XYZ and all of our cameras have settled into good locations, we've got what we call a sparse point cloud. From there, we go through this point cloud densification step where we will try and find other pixels in the images and create the space between those, those initial key points. And then from there, we take the, um, the actual content of the images and we create uh, the 3D models on top of that dense point cloud. And what's kind of funny is most people will look at the 2D map and say, oh, that's so simple. But the 2D map creation is actually the last step. What we're doing in photogrammetry is, is those 2D maps are called author mosaics, and the author stands for orthographic. And so that means that um, it's very much as the crow flies. You can measure distance in that 2D image, and it will be an accurate distance if you measure it on the ground. If you think of a normal picture, um, you know that picture is going to have perspective. So if you're, say, you've got like a mug or something on your table, and you sit next to that mug, you'll see the side of the mug. And even if you're looking from the top down, but you're not directly over it, you'll still kind of see a glimmer of the side of the mug. What we're doing with those auto mosaics is we're squashing all of the depth out of the images to make something that's flat so that you'll never see the sides of buildings or the sides of objects. That's what allows us to do those distance measurements in an accurate way. Wow. Um, <laughs> that's a very good explanation. I wish I could do like uh, some graphics with that. Maybe I'll have to, um, to develop it. But I think you made a, a very, very good point in that, um, you know, I've, st I still see today, like, and people are just trying, people still need to learn. It's a very, uh, complicated process to, to kind of really start truly understanding photogrammetry. We used to say like, you used, you have to think when you're flying the drone and taking images, you have to think like a photogrammetric algorithm <laughs> whenever you're trying to. <laughs> To, to create things and so you can't just take two images or three or four or 20 50 whatever and line them up in photoshop and then call that like an ortho mosaic because it's not it's not to scale and it's not there's no the the perspective isn't correct now um another thing we used to say is photogrammetry is more art than science this is a very famous drone to play saying <laughs> um with so many years now under your belt and so much kind of innovation and and work having gone into drone deploys photogrammetric algorithms, is this phrase no longer as true as it once was? I mean, you, you know where I'm getting at here. Like, yeah. are there a lot more kind of variables we can account for given what we know and the developments that have come from this um, as far as drone deploy goes? Yeah, that's a great question. So why why I, I we said more art than science is it's 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 a, a system where it's kind of garbage in garbage out so if you take um three pictures and they're all of the sky and you throw them into the algorithm we're not going to be able to create a reconstruction of your building um, you need to have good coverage of your building and because the world is full of things that are different shapes um, good coverage kind of means different things for, for different places so if you're out there mapping a big field, all you really need is to take these images from the top down. If you're starting to map uh, something like a statue, um, you're going to have to start to get a lot more what we call obliques, images from the side of the statue. And starting to understand different scenes and scene types and how they create models and how the, the algorithms work with those scene types uh, is what helps understand what the flight patterns and the data capture should be so that you have good data coming in will give you good data going out. Exactly. And, and there's been a ton of improvements as well to the to map engine. Um, Definitely. From and, what I understand. And, you know, we've done a ton of work on the processing side to try and improve what the, um, the algorithms are able to do with input imagery and, and we'll try and select the best ways to process different types of content. For example, in agriculture, corn, um, 
if you, if the if the grower has done a good job, every image looks pretty much identical. So how do you make a map where everything looks the same? It's like it's like someone gives you a ten thousand piece puzzle, and every puzzle piece looks identical. You know, you got to try and like it's trying to find this a, a point to lock onto. The algorithm is yeah, a similar exactly. point in two images and multiple. And so you, you need to start looking for different types of features in different types of ways uh, compared to if you're trying to do a reconstruction of something like a building. And so what our systems are doing is, is actually starting to leverage uh, some machine learning in order to figure out what is the content of the scene and how should, you know, what, what algorithms should we start putting into place in order to try and process data best for this type of scene. Today's episode is brought to you by kittyhawk.io, the enterprise solution for drone operations management, available on the web, iOS, Android, and DJI's Crystal Sky. Operating a successful commercial drone program doesn't have to involve a ton of tools and time making them talk to each other. With Kitty Hawk, you can manage your aircraft, operators, and airspace all from a single unified platform. Managers can use Kitty Hawk to monitor their fleet, assign missions, and effortlessly track compliance. Your pilots fly in the Kitty Hawk app with safety and compliance settings that you customize based on your company's needs. There's even an API to make integrating Kitty Hawk into your workflows easy and automatic. Visit kittyhawk.io to learn more. Skywatch.ai is a leading drone safety and insurance solution, providing inclusive, flexible, and affordable coverage for commercial drone pilots, from single operators to enterprise users. Protect your business, drone, and equipment by obtaining Skywatch AI's liability and physical damage coverage, either with an hourly or a monthly plan. Skywatch AI's hourly plan allows you to get insurance on the spot for a specific job at an affordable price. The monthly plan lets you fly with peace of mind, with complete liability and physical damage coverage that you can change as needed. Additionally, as a safe pilot, you can save up to 50% on your premiums just by flying safely over time. Download the skywatch.ai app through the App Store, Google Play, and the Drone Deploy app market and get drone insurance that's tailored to your needs. Okay, back to the show. And so <clears throat> one of one of I think the coolest innovations that Drone Deploy has has created. Um, it's called Live Map. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Live Map? What's so special about that? And maybe some of the new improvements uh, that have been made to it um, over the past. I don't know. Mike Wynn. So Mike Wynn, the CEO, was the past. Was the, so I, there's three co-founders. Let me a little drone to play history lesson. Three <laughs> co-founders of drone to play. Nick Pilkington, Mike Wynn, John O'Millen. And I've had all two or all three on the podcast now John, John is the third uh but mike win i think it must have been a year ago it was whenever the series b was announced uh he was on the show and then nick pilkington was like episode two of the podcast now we're up at like in the 80s um but just for that little history lesson um some you know live map was probably announced a year ago or so what's new with it but what first of all what is live map yeah so Live map is one thing that that we had been dreaming about since the beginning days of drone deploy. We're very focused on how do we make this as accessible and simple and easy to use as possible so that you're not having to faff around and push buttons and try and understand all the knobs and dials. You can just like, you know, the inspiration is kind of something like a Roomba. You just press the clean button and it cleans. Um, so when when going out and making this this data using drones, you know the the process of old, and it's funny to say that you know we're looking at the process of old in drones because it's still super <laughs> new age technology. But the process of old was um, you would go out, you'd fly, you'd capture a whole bunch of images, and then you would upload those images to our servers to do this very compute intensive um, photogrammetry process, and. You know, picture yourself, you're the agronomist who's going out to map something for a farmer. Um, you're driving three hours to get out to the field. You fly your drone. Um, there's no data or signal out in the field. It's, it's kind of a rural area. You then have to drive back home. You upload these images. You wait for the processing to happen. Uh, and then you can drive back out again to go and walk the field and try and ground truth some data. So that's kind of a, a painful process because you've driven three hours out, you've driven three hours back. And even if we make the processing instantaneous once it's been uploaded, 
you've still got that kind of nine hours of driving bet- before you're back out in the field again with data. Um, so what we're, what we're looking to do here with LiveMap is how can we make it so that at the edge of the field, while the drone is still in flight, you can start to see your data, you can start to do some analysis, and you can start to walk the field and actually ground truth that data. And so we, we did a, a huge amount of work and, and research and engineering, and, and we probably one of those things that you develop uh, over the course of like three years uh, where you try something, but then the drone's video signal or the drone's data signal wasn't strong enough. And then, you know, the, the iPhones and iPads didn't have enough compute power and our algorithms weren't efficient enough. And through this like iteration of both the hardware getting much better and the devices getting much better <laughs> and our algorithms getting much better, we were able to make it so that while the drone is busy flying, that map kind of appears um, right there uh, in real time. In real time on the device. And I, I remember those days. I mean, today's a Friday, like it's Friday afternoon. Demos are going to start at Drone Deploy per usual and like internal demos. And so, uh, you know, what the team's been working on. But I remember the days, yeah, when we would make like a little bit of progress. And it was it was a long R&D process. Like this was like really intensive. And the final product now is like so awesome and it works so smoothly and it's only getting better. And so now when it originally launched, it was specifically for RGB, um, like straight from the drone's camera, like a normal drone camera, RGB camera. Yeah. Um, but now it's, there's thermal live map, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've upgraded the algorithms, you know, thermal is a whole new challenge because the, the cameras work quite differently. Like the, the optics and the camera intrinsics are quite different. Um, the resolution is much, much lower. You know, the fancy thermal cameras are like 640 by 500 pixels, like that range. And and a normal, like a, let's say just like a Phantom 4 Pro is like what, 4,000 by 3,000 or uh, more? Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah, it's like in the many thousands. So it's, yeah. you're talking about like um, a 20, 30 times the number of pixels on, on an RGB camera to a thermal camera. So, you know, being able to make those algorithms work where the key points are going to be harder to detect and to you know do that photogrammetry process with thermal data was another big challenge but again you know we're working with um, roofing contractors in commercial buildings or out on these big remote solar fields if you're able to identify the problem and do something about it right there and then uh, that's a game changer do you see a day then given the advancements in uh, photogrammetry And well, not just photogrammetry, but of hardware on these little supercomputers that we all carry in our pockets. Do you see a day then where the entire process of like having to upload data, um, you know, uh, straight up to, you know, like the raw data, quote unquote, do you see a day where that's kind of just like just ancient history, you know, obsolete? Yeah, it's it's interesting when looking at kind of analogs. there are a bunch of different ways you could, you know, skin the cat, as they say. You can uh, basically uh, the, the 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 short story is I think that it's going to be a combination forever. Uh, people, some subset of people, are always going to want the highest quality, most amazing maps and models, and the the cloud processing is always going to be able to deliver that much better than the real time wall. Mm. So some subset of people are always going to want to have that best. That being said, the live map, um, you know, we're just in the process of pushing out a revision to that where it's going to be, you know, even higher resolution because the the cameras are better, the signal processing is better, um, and it starts to become more and more indistinguishable from those author mosaics that we know and love unless you zoom way, way, way down. You know, we, we've also been prototyping out and investigating how can we do that live map in 3D so that we can do the full 3D reconstruction instead of just the 2D. Uh, you know, I, I never expect that to completely replace the full process and especially for people who want that best. But what we're trying to tackle with that is there is a subset of issues that all you need is good enough. Mm. And wherever possible, can we provide good enough in real time? 
Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it's all about. The deskless workforce, you know, shout out to Emergence Capital and Kevin Spain. He was guest number one. So Emergence <laughs> Capital is a investor in drone deploy, but they, you know, the deskless workforce, like they have the mobile device, they're in the field, they want to take action and that's how they can get more efficient. So exactly. um, it's, it's all going towards that way, uh, in my opinion as well. One other crazy, awesome thing that drone deploy has been doing and something um, that I would like just an update on personally is just AI at drone deploy. So like you can kind of call like, I guess photogrammetry has some AI and probably some machine learning components into it, but there's more of like the um, end user facing UI or sorry, AI components that you guys have been working on. And um, these were announced, I don't know, maybe within the last couple quarters or so. Um, tell us a little bit about what you guys have been doing, like with all this data drone deploy has processed. How, I don't even remember, know how many millions of acres of, data now but there's just so much there's this huge data set yeah so like what's being done with it no exactly um one thing that that many people might not know is that uh both nick pilkington and myself uh so two of the three co-founders were doing phds in machine learning before starting the company so we saw these drones and we always have kind of had this perspective of this is a new source of crazy amounts of data about the physical world and you know the vision that we had really really early on is that the iot space was supposed to solve this uh, connected outdoors problem but you can't go and put an iot sensor on every single brick in a construction site and have it self-report like that's that's just not going to be feasible and when you've got all these things out there in this kind of industrial space um it's pretty easy for dust intrusion or batteries or connectivity or all these other issues to happen. And so what we're kind of thinking is like, well, let's have drones and you get this one sensor and the sensor moves itself around. And if we're smart enough on the software and the, the detection side of things, then it can fill in for a whole bunch of those types of sensors. And, you know, we'll never be able to replace things like a flow rate sensor or uh, you know, the, the, a whole bunch of things that like, obviously, you know, they're, they're going to be collaborative, but, uh, in terms of just getting a general picture of how the world is working, uh, this visual space is, is really good. I mean, that's what we as, uh, human beings and, you know, all the animals in, in the kingdom have developed over millions of years of evolution is using the visual system as one of our primary sources of input data. So what we what we started with in the early days was just how do we get the drone to fly and then it was like how do we you know we've got the drone to fly uh, and we've got it to capture some data but how do we make sense of that data how do we make it so that you can zoom anywhere and see something and you can look at a problem and say where is that in the real world then the next step was like okay cool we can start to do some analysis and measure things uh, on this data and it's like okay now we can build some reports on this data and as we keep leveling up we've also started to work with bigger and bigger organizations. And one of the primary concerns that they typically have is, I want to make sure that I can send 10 people out into the field and get the same result 10 times in a row. And as soon as you have like more knobs and more dials and you know somebody's uh, own subjective opinion that they're bringing into the mix, it becomes harder to ensure that same result 10 out of 10 times. And the only way that we can see to really deliver an experience like that and deliver it seamlessly and, and in an intuitive way is to build it uh, through automation. And so that's automation in the flight, making sure that it's just a flight plan. You just press the takeoff button and we will make sure that the drone's flying the same pattern, taking the same photographs time after time. Same with the processing. You know, the, there, we don't have many knobs and dials and, and things that you can fiddle with our processing. You throw your images in drone deploy and you get your data out. And where machine learning has really started to take off a drone deploy is on that analysis side. So we've got all these rich data sets of, you know, tens of thousands of people have been uploading their data. They've all been tagging GCPs on drone deploy, for example. So those of you who don't know, GCPs are ground control points. They're like an accuracy tool. They basically help make sure that your data is accurate in the real world to very precise levels for survey grade type use cases. Uh, and the way it works is you have these markers that are visible from the air and you measure them with like a, a handheld GPS on the ground and you tell us where those markers are in space. And it's kind of like a big stretchy cloth is your map and we're nailing it down with those GCPs to like a big wooden board. Um, finding all of the images that have one of those markers in it 
and figuring out which marker is associated to it is a real pain in the butt. How many markers can there be sometimes on like the super like large scale for some of these big maps? Yeah, some of the larger maps we process will have over 100 GCPs. So that's 100 times that a human would have to go in, look for it, try to get close to it, try to get it perfectly placed. Well, that that will be 100 GCPs that are going to probably be in about 6 to 10 images each. Um, so you got like six, hmm. 600 to 1,000 images of GCPs. But then you've also got like another eight, 9,000 images that don't have GCPs in it. So you've got to page through like nine, 10,000 images to find the ones that have the GCPs and then figure out which GCP it is and then be very precise about where you place it. And it's, it's, a, real, it's a real issue. So because we've had some people go through this process manually, we can now train machine learning models to automatically identify GCPs and automatically figure out what the center is. And so that whole workflow has changed from people manually paging through stuff to try and find them to, um, you know, just make it so that you stick all your data in, you tell us where you think they are and we'll find them and we'll put our best guess as where the center is. And we give you the opportunity to sign off on it and make any corrections if necessary. But every correction you make then goes back into training our models to be smarter. Mm. And it's not just the ground control points that, that this feature is for. I think you guys announced some um, other features kind of that are yeah. being applied to the to this machine learning. And so can you just give us some examples of some of the other things? Some people want to count things. Some people want to identify, is this in the map at all? Is this object? Yeah, exactly. So on the counting front, there's a ton of value there too. Uh, one of our large customers is in the agricultural insurance space. And they basically provide insurance on um, crops, but also orchards. And the way that they would figure out how much to pay out to a, a grower or a farmer in, in an orchard is that have somebody walk around with a clicker in one hand for trees that are alive and a clicker in the other hand for trees that are dead. And they'd walk up and down the rows and either say alive, alive, dead, alive, dead, dead, alive. And at the end, they would look at it and say, okay, uh, we've got... Um, 6,000 that are alive and 200 that are dead, we owe you the payout for 200. Uh, and oftentimes they can't actually map, they can't actually walk up and down the whole area because it's so big that they'll do a small subsection and just multiply it out. But you know, like pests and disease, it's very local. And so you have these arguments between farmer and insurer where the farmer's like, the problem's way bigger than you're saying it is. And the insurer is saying like, no, no, it's much smaller. And we can bring data to it. So we can have the drone take off, make a live map, um, and right there in the field, you can see the data. We can then put that data through our count AI, which will be able to count trees and classify them into alive or dead. And we can generate a report that will tell them exactly how many trees are alive and are dead. And then that payout becomes completely objective based on science. You're covering the entire area instead of just one small subsection. And everyone feels that it's a fair process because it's not based on you know some multiplication of random numbers and it's not you know based on some gut or intuition i mean this is this is all like this is the stuff we've been chasing and i say we it's like the we of when I, when I was still a drone deploy of course but like this is amazing to see that it's like it's it's available now and like it's kind of feels like to me like the future is here with this kind of capability um the only tr the only next step i believe is then automating the drone flight so that it only you know the, the, the human doesn't have to be there but that's going to be a whole regulatory uh, other issue so really really fascinating updates um i'm sure customers are eating this up and absolutely loving it um so that's just uh, that's super cool um one quick you know other thing that you were telling me about just briefly before we started chatting um, is something that you're kind of heading up uh, at Drone Deploy, something new. Um, you guys are starting or have started a kind of professional services um, service. Yeah. <laughs> For lack of a better a lack of a better term. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and kind of, you know, who that's who that's for. Why did you build this? Like, what is this? What is this about? Sure. So as time has gone on, um, Drones have piqued the interest of larger and larger organizations. And, you know, when you when you look at some of these larger organizations, the risk of doing something wrong the first time becomes bigger and bigger. And when we've been working with our customers, we found that time and time again, uh, they kept asking us for advice. Like, how do we start our drone program? What What should our standard operating procedures be? How do we train our people to make sure they're doing the right things? Um, and 
all of these questions kind of kept coming up to us. And you know, even uh, what if I don't want to fly? How do I find someone who can fly for us? And we realized that we ended up just having been in the industry for so long. And from the beginning, we ended up being kind of industry experts in the space. And so when we have these large organizations joining up now, we're basically offering them a suite of uh, professional services to help them do their drone program right from scratch. So how do we help you identify your standard operating procedures? How do we make sure that uh, there's safety and compliance? What should your hardware maintenance schedule be? Which drones should you buy? All these kind of questions that these uh, large organizations might have off the bat we can sit down, we can work with them, we can build out all this documentation, all these processes, the data flows, uh, all of those bits and pieces to make sure that they're building their drone program right from day one. And you know, after that, uh, how do we make sure that the entire organization is trained on those standard operating procedures and knows how to use the software correctly? And so we can do that either in person through webinars or uh, a new system that we're putting out there, the Drone Deploy Academy, which is uh, a suite of online kind of teach yourself tools that can be customized so that you can have your own custom trainings uh, by drone deploy for your organization nice very nice that's cool i mean these are, these are all things that it, all those little pieces together just go to the final value prop is it's just like look we help you make decisions based on accurate data and then improve your entire organization's efficiency um, so really nice to see uh, drone deploy going towards that uh, avenue as well. Um, what so what's then like looking just ahead? I mean, five years uh, has gone by. Six years uh, since <laughs> drone deploy has been founded. I mean, it's been a long, wild ride. Like, where are you looking to next? I mean, what are some of the things that you're focusing on? If if I come back here in a year. Um, for some free beer, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? And what's, what's new, um, at, at drone deploy, maybe a year from now, like give us may like get a little creative here. Feel free to, maybe you can, uh, paint the picture for us. Yeah. So it, our, our vision has always been, how do we make drones accessible and productive for anyone? And, uh, more and more that focus is being driven by the, the really high impact businesses. When you're starting to work with these multi-billion dollar uh, organizations and they have the power to radically improve just like their efficiency, the massively reducing waste that has you know big impacts on the climate and the environment, um, we're, we're really helping to drive change with uh, in the world. And all of that ends up with you know cheaper products, with people being fed more uh, effectively, not using as many pesticides. Like, the, the, the impact of the kinds of things that we're doing is very far reaching and, and uh, super exciting for me. So what are we basically gonna be focusing on is, is how can we do that more faster and better? Um, for us, as I said, you know, that automation component is key. So how do we make sure that uh, we can take that flight to the, the next level? When, when you started talking about um, the, the drones flying themselves on, on schedules or drones living in boxes, you know, I think that's 100% that's going to be the future. You're going to have someone come in and install a box on top of your job site trailer at your construction site. And uh, every day at certain times, the drone's going to take off, fly around, make some maps. And we'll be there to process that data and all of those machine learning tools that we have, that's going to help do the analysis. Because when you start to look at several data sets a day, it's going to start going beyond the capabilities of one person manually looking for issues. And you're going to start to want to do things like import your design plans uh, through your Procore or Autodesk integration and automatically um, detect whether there are any anomalies or, or if you're going off track anyway, are there any kind of deltas between plan and build. Um, so, so doubling down on that automation to make that, that workflow even faster, close that loop even tighter. And then focusing on all the other problems that, that organizations might face in getting these things off the ground. Um, so helping them out on, on you know, the compliance side, that training side, doubling down on, on those types of issues, um, making sure that we can help them track their ROI. Uh, you know, something we still continue to believe in is a big part of our, our company that uh, we've seen just pay dividends down the road working with, with other companies as our platform. We, we are out and we're going to plan on solving a whole bunch of different problems, but 
you know what, we're just one small company, we can't solve them all. How do we work with best in class players in order to double down on our platform and make sure that the drone deploy data that we're creating isn't stuck in some kind of data silo? You can build your own apps on top of us. You can integrate with key players in the industry uh, so that you can just have a very seamless kind of uh, jump on and, and plug in and your workflow is just that much better, faster, more effective. Shout out to the drone deploy app market and those really nice APIs. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. That's a very good answer. <laughs> I'm satisfied with this. I mean, no, I totally agree. I hope that within a year that we can see some like automation and you know maybe the ipp is going to help promote that that some of these other companies are kind of involved in to make sure that drones can fly safely when people aren't at the controls all the time and flying beyond a visual line of sight um i guess to close this out this is a question i don't ask often i used to ask it a lot more and the question the answers weren't as varied so i'm going to ask you what is your <laughs> what is your favorite drone of all time jono and why could be any drone ever like maybe it was some little tiny drone maybe it was some insignificant thing something you crashed and you were sad like I'll, I'll give you i'll give you um an interesting answer that that and i got a bunch of drones for a bunch of different reasons uh, maybe i'll pick two the the first one is probably i don't even know the name of it it's about the 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 um, span of it's probably about my thumb's length um I bought it on Amazon for $20 and <laughs> that included prime delivery and it had an FPV camera with Wi-Fi. And I, I got this thing in, I think it was probably like 2016. And I just could not believe that I could buy something for $20 that had all of that stabilization, that had a camera, that had the ability to broadcast over wireless to my phone. Um, and, and to me, that was like, it's honestly probably flown five times, mm. but I leave it sitting on my desk as just a reminder of like, wow, the technology can move so quickly. And uh, if if the scale is there, you can turn something that was, you know, when we started the company, you couldn't buy a drone off the shelf. Mm. And then three years later for $20, you can buy this <laughs> FPV Wi-Fi connected drone that that is surprisingly stable. Um, that blew my mind. That's crazy. Is, is, it that, is that the tiny whoop or is that... No, 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 this smaller. is uh, smaller and cheaper. Wow. Um, I'll, I'll show you on the way up. Okay. The other one I'd say is probably the Inspire One. Um, that was such a badass drone. Yeah. It still looks amazing. It still looks science fiction. And I remember being at the launch event in 2014. Uh, we're now sitting in 2019. And it's still like a pretty God, that capable... that was 2014. Yeah. Wow. Pretty capable, badass drone um and just looks looks like it's from the future i don't know why i'm so surprised i every time actually that someone's like yeah the inspire one is in 2014 back in 2017 i was like that was 2014 wow <laughs> i'm always so amazed that that was such a pivotal time i think for the whole commercial drone industry was dji launching that platform and then of course the sdk that came along with it um was yeah. crazy but i mean okay so 2014 geez now it's 2019 so almost five years old for that thing Oof, time's gonna, we're going to get some gray hairs, Jono, but it'll be worth it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> well, Jono, um, thank you so much for, for joining us. We finally got to air our episode like one year later than planned, roughly. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you. If you're listening and you want to learn more about Drone Deploy, uh, check out the website at dronedeploy.com. And then if you want to learn even more about Drone Deploy and get even into the nitty gritty, check out the ROI focused case studies and all the different product updates. Go to blog.dronedeploy.com and follow them on Twitter, Facebook at Drone Deploy. Um, I still remember all the all the call outs. There you go. It's pretty there easy to remember. But uh, <laughs> while you're at it, you can check out the podcast. Um, we're at twitter.com slash drones podcast, facebook.com slash drones podcast, and commercialdrones.fm in your web browser. Um, that's all we've got today for you folks. We got to get down to demos. Um, so we got to get things popping. But Jono, Chief Customer Officer, co founder at Drone Deploy, thank you so much for being a guest today. Austin Perry, great to chat. Cheers, everybody. Bye bye. Commercial Drones FM is supported by MicaSense. MicaSense develops drone-based sensors for agriculture. With hundreds of research publications, dozens of case studies, and customers in over 75 countries, 
MicaSense sensors are proven to increase yield and save your customers money. For more information on what a MicaSense sensor can help you achieve, visit micasense.com.